Welcome to you all. My name is Andrew Chung. I am artistic producer of London Symphonia and welcome to our season opener, our first uh, edition of Behind the Music. And I've got Kelly Marie Murphy joining me today. Hello, Kelly. Hi, Andrew. Nice and to meet you finally. <laughs> I know it's been so long. We've had a lot of emails long... back and forth. <laughs> Email correspondence. Oh my goodness. But we're finally here ahead of our October 22nd concert. And we are performing um, a piece by Kelly Marie Murphy called En el Escuro es Todo Uno and translated as, I believe, In the Darkness We Are All One and hence the title of our concert, We Are All One. So let's dive right in, Kelly. So, you know, this is such a unique work. It's a double concerto. Um, you've got a harp and a cello solo set on it, but by, its, by itself is unusual. Yeah. Um, it's an Israeli Music Prize winner. And we can talk about that. And it's one of the most prestigious awards in Canada. Um, and this work, I believe, is based on Ladino folk songs. So from the Sephardic tradition. So, mm -hmm. so many points of inspiration. Which one came first? Well, uh, the first thing to do was uh, to come up with a proposal. Like, um, this is one of those uh, competitions where um, it's not just that you're sending in your works to be judged and to be chosen. You know, um, you have to write a proposal. What is the piece that you would create? And the question from the Azrieli Foundation was, um, what does Jewish music mean to you? And I remember the first, the very first year, I thought, well, I don't even have an answer to that question. <laughs> so I couldn't, you know, put my hat into the ring. Um, but the second year, I thought, you know, really, uh, like, like, just do it, you know, and that was the first um, impetus, the first inspiration was just, you know, think of something, articulate a project. And so I, I spent a while thinking, well, how would I answer that question? And, um, of course, there's been a lot of music written um, in the Ashkenazi tradition, klezmer, uh, Eastern European uh, Jewish music. Um, and so I thought, you know, I I don't need to do that. What else is there? So I started to, you know, ask my Jewish friends, you know, what what is Jewish music? What does it mean? And um, so one of my friends uh, said, do you know anything about Sephardic music? And I'm like, no, I do not. Um, and so I started listening and I went, oh my gosh, where has this been all my life? So um, it was kind of like that. But uh, so in that in trying to make a proposal to enter this comp competition um i i decided okay what would i want to do and create this piece and i remember thinking you know after um i i wrote about wanting to um do something with the uh, Ladino folk songs and work that into a double concerto for a harp and cello. Um, and I remember, um, you know, at the deadline and I was uh, submitting this, and I'm thinking, wow, I'd, I'd really love to write this piece. <laughs> and, you know, you don't think I'm going to be able to write this piece because it, it's just, I, I, you don't think like that. And then um, getting, getting the call that I had won the competition and I do get to write this piece. It was like, oh my goodness, uh, you know, it, it gets to actually come to fruition. So um, that was the starting point for me to just take that step into the answering the question of what does Jewish music mean to me? Wow, so cool. Um, and then is it because it's a folk song tradition, this Ladino music, is that kind of where you get the, you know, the harp element and then you wanted a singing instrument like the cello? Mm, I had a lot to do with it. I mean, I sort of, um, I think starting with, uh, I'd really like to write for Couloir, which is the, the harp and cello duo. And these are two people that I've known, uh, you know, we've worked together before in the Vancouver Symphony and, and other places, but um, I've never had the opportunity to write for them. So I thought, well, let's just combine a whole bunch of things that I'm interested in. And then, you know, you're right. When I started to think about it, um, I always think of the cello um, 
like a voice and both instruments um i mean the the coloristic uh, techniques that are available are just uh, astounding um and they can also be percussive you know they it's a, a big wooden bass you know with the harp and the cello um so you those elements of um you know, percussion from the Iberian Peninsula, um, that played into it as well. And I think it really does uh, hit on those folk elements uh, very well. Mm. And you've, you've composed uh, music for these instruments separately. Um, I was, <laughs> when, when I was just talking to Cameron, he said you composed a piece for him, right? Yes, I did. Um, so Cameron and I, uh, I mean, we met at a, a music competition. Um, he was playing and he wasn't playing my my music, but I, I happened to be there and heard him play. And then um, I hear this voice uh, behind me, Kelly, Kelly. And it's Cameron's mom, Ingrid, <laughs> who I went to school with at the University of Calgary. Oh, um, no way. Oh, yeah, we, we were both grad students together. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. And now, you know, and so... Uh, Cameron and I uh, just struck up this um, friendship and um, that connection. Um, so being able to write for him, he was still studying in, in Paris at the time and, you know, had this amazing instrument from the Canada Council Instrument Bank. Um, and you know, in addition to that, I've written a cello concerto. Uh, I've written for eight cellos. I've written, oh, really? uh, <laughs> you know, the, the king of instruments, right? So yeah. I, I, I like the cello. And you one like of my, the cello, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's a thing. I, I like the harp, but I, I, you know, that that's a that's hard to to rent a harp. At one point, um, I can't remember it. My actually, it was it was this double concerto. I rented a cello just to try out some things. I do not play the cello, but it was mostly oh. the those percussive uh, things that I wanted to try. And uh, so I lugged this thing home, and uh, I could not get a sound on it. And I'm like, okay, I'm a pianist, and I <laughs> don't know what is going on here. Um, so I I send Cameron an email like I rented this cello. It looks like you know all the strings are there, and you know I tightened up the bow, and all I get is you know like nothing. And he's just you know very calm. He said, <laughs> Kelly. Um, is there rosin with this? <laughs> so, um, apparently rosin is what makes this all work. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> life yeah. is all about learning, right? <laughs> and who's to say whether the sound that came out of your cello, even with rosin, was a beautiful sound I or know, not? Oh, I know. It's <laughs> all history. All history. Yes, exactly. You know what what happens in the practice room stays in the practice room. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's so great. <laughs> okay, so um the in your words, uh, uh, it says it says here in a quote, uh, encourages it, this piece encourages us to understand that we are all equal. Once you remove the trappings of society and economy, we are more similar than we are different. How do you translate yeah. that into music, Kelly? Oh my gosh! Well, I mean, that's that's the age old question, right? Um, I like a narrative because that helps me, and I figure if it helps me to organize my thoughts, maybe it's a point of reaching out to the audience and and you know the performers and the audience, so that we all have kind of a um, uh, an understanding of what might take place. But I just thought this, this proverb, this Ladino proverb was just uh, timeless. I mean, doesn't it, it speaks to what's happening now and, and what's always happened that, um, you know, let's, let's just get rid of the obvious things and the superficial things. And, look a little deeper and you will find that you have connections with people and with other cultures and, you know, with the world around you. Um, so I just thought it was um, a very nice way of thinking about things and probably something that we need um, quite, <laughs> quite a lot in, in the world today. So I was happy to kind of lend that, uh, to the music and it's an organization, um, 
of folk songs, these Ladino songs. Um, and you can imagine, you know, this oral tradition and how much music there is. And so I, in my research, I was like, holy smokes, I've got just a ton of music here. So how do I even narrow it down? And so I chose songs about the lives of women in the community. Um, and so again, you know, I'm, I'm writing, I guess, as a, a female composer, but it speaks to everyone, I think, if you, you know, if you don't notice how we're different, then hopefully you notice how we're the same. And maybe that, that um, bridges that uh, communication, um, you know, that, that we have that ability to communicate with one another. That's beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just so I fully understand this, so the Ladino songs, it's an oral tradition, and doing your mm -hmm. research, you're looking at transcriptions of, mm -hmm. you know, these songs. And yeah. did you meet with someone who sings these songs at some point? I did. Well, Sharon Azrieli, um is a singer and she has a, a sweet soft spot for um, Sephardic, uh, these Ladino songs. So uh, she, and, and she was also a cantor for quite a while in Montreal. Um, so I spent a, a day with her uh, and just reading through various songs and seeing the possibilities. I mean, what I love about any, any world music is that it becomes um, quite individual depending on how you ornament certain, you know, phrases and passages. Um, and that was certainly something in the Sephardic tradition. So I found that really fascinating. And um, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, the, the Azraeli foundation was uh, really good about connecting me with anyone I needed you know, to, to bounce, uh, you know, questions or ideas off. Um, and I also um, met with another friend who is actually from Morocco and, you know, uh, grew up uh, in this tradition. And I, I said, well, you know, what would it have been like? And, and uh, she said to me, well, if you can imagine that, you know, with the, the climate, everything is outside. So you couldn't really, if, if, the the communities would have wanted to segregate themselves and you know i'm i'm only doing jewish music or i'm only doing um arabic music or i'm only doing spanish music you know whatever it was impossible they would have heard the music of the other cultures and that's why this rich uh tradition uh exists um so i i thought that that was fascinating and just all of these elements that i i could bring it together and you know you can see the importance of the umbrella of holding these thoughts together because it's a lot <laughs> you know it was like yeah. sand running through my hands yeah. so <laughs> it's so vast isn't it any of these old cultures these old world musics when you dive in um you know, oh my gosh, I can't, I can only imagine that journey. And especially that day when you're, 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 you're speaking with Sharon and, yeah. and, uh, and she's singing these songs to you and I can just, oh, what I wouldn't do yeah. to fly on the wall on that day. That would have just been yeah. extraordinary. It was, it was great. I was, I was on the piano and, and she was singing and we were just leafing through, you know, some, uh, she had some, I had bought a couple of uh, books of transcriptions and we were just like, okay, what about this one? Oh, that's the, you know, Bulgarian version of this. And here's the, you know, it was just amazing that the music travels with the people. And that's why we have access to so much um, music outside of the Western tradition, right? So Perfect. It was thank fun. you. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for your piece and for joining me for today uh, to chat about uh, the new work. And we're really oh, my excited. Pleasure. We're oh, really excited to, to hear it and put it all together for October 22nd. Cheers. Oh, I am very, very happy to to be with you and looking forward to the concert. Thank you so much. Amazing. Welcome now to our two guest soloists for Kelly Marie Murphy's piece, En el Escuro Es Todo Onu. Um, and we've got Angela Schwarzkopf. Hi, Angela. And Angela's our principal harp in London Symphony. And we've got Cameron Crosman. Hey, Cameron. Hi. 
great that you could both join me uh, for a little chit chat before the concert. So uh, let's start with Angela. So Angela, what was your first introduction to this piece um, by Kelly Marie Murphy? Well, um, I'd heard it performed. Well, I didn't have never heard it performed live, unfortunately, but I've heard it, heard the piece, knew about the piece. And I was approached by the Toronto Summer Music Festival back in 2021. That seems like the right year. And they asked if I would be interested in performing it as part of their festival. And um, I really love new music. I really love Canadian new music. So when they asked, I thought, of course, <laughs> I would be yeah. happy to learn this concerto and perform it. For sure, that's a big deal when a when a new harp concerto arrives, uh, Canadian written, you know, harp concerto. That's pretty cool. So you were already aware of it, and then the opportunity presented itself to you, <clears throat> and then you just had to say yes. Of course, how can you say no? Simple as that. And then who did you perform that with? Like, who was this, the cello soloist? Was oh, it Cameron. It was not Cameron. It was not me. <laughs> it was Stefan. And now I can't remember Stefan's last name. Uh, uh, Stefan Tetro. Stefan Tetro, right? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he, he resides in Quebec. Uh, he had performed the concerto a number of times before. He works with Valerie Milo, who's an... Uh, Quebec harpist and they had um, played the concerto together a number of times and so I was really lucky to get to play with him for my first time because he had already a lot of good inside knowledge and tips and suggestions for ways that we can uh, really make the piece shine. Awesome awesome yeah. yeah and now we'll be able to 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 swap roles here since this will be my first time playing the piece. <laughs> yeah so hopefully I'll be able to tra translate that to you now we'll just keep passing <laughs> the torch along. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the arc here are you two meeting really the week of the concert to kind of really knit this together? <clears throat> yeah I mean we've been chatting we 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 were gonna try and get together a little bit beforehand and spend some time just playing through the parts I mean a lot of them are quite a lot of the writing is quite like a duet like we're really duetting together so it'll be nice to get a chance to play through that together before the orchestra joins us yeah. definitely now Cameron you've always been a champion of new music so when approaching this piece or or any new piece what what do you focus on first is it kind of the technical aspects of it for you or is it you're trying to back away and just get the general aesthetic of it all do you reach out to the composer or what's what's your first move Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, I, I actually know Kelly quite well. She wrote a piece for me back in 2017 for solo cello, which I believe was right around the same time this piece was written. So it's been fun to uh, to see. I think there's a lot of similarities in the cello writing between the piece she wrote for me and this concerto. Uh, and so that's always nice because already I have a sort of, uh, you know, a, a departure point for her style. And I, I can sort of already hear some of her uh, the gestures and musical things she's going for. I think that's what I've realized is is very important working with uh, composers of new music is that it's 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 really this impossible task that composers have of taking an idea and especially in more contemporary music, these ideas are often very gestural, they're full of colors, they maybe have some extended techniques and and to translate that into some sort of notation that can communicate that uh, that that desire to the performer is not always easy and each composer sort of I think finds their own way to do that so a lot of my approach to the music is really trying to understand what is the composer going for uh, and then uh, finding a way to to bring that out and, and obviously talking with the composer is always a great way to do that it's the thing that's convenient when they're still alive <laughs> it's rather convenient <laughs> just a phone call away or an email or whatever oh my goodness and 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 being a Canadian composer, do you feel like you can reach out to that person just that that little bit more easily and, you know, try to create a, a, a dynamic or, a, you know, try to try to get a little bit deeper into that understanding? For sure. And, and Kelly, as I said, is someone I know well and, and we've talked about even some of other pieces. She would throw me ideas every now and then say, is this playable on cello? And uh, I'm actually seeing her in two days. I'm going over to Ottawa to play for her. So uh, it's it's definitely a lot easier. I mean, Canadians we're known to be very friendly people too, so it's never. Uh, I think composers in general are just thrilled when performers want to 
champion their music and and uh, you know and perform it and make it make it come alive. Yeah, I, I can't actually. I'm not a composer. I can't conceptualize that you create something with such care and detail, and then you release it out there, and then open for wild interpretation, um, oh, <laughs> or not so wild, depending where that's going to go. <laughs> And, and Angela, you've got quite a connection too to new composers. I know you champion new music as well. Describe for me about what's the thrill uh, of working with a, a living composer? I mean, <clears throat> I think that notation and musical scores have become so sophisticated that really composers are able to convey pretty clearly what they would like. Um, from performers but sometimes when things are first written maybe things aren't as refined or as clear and so it's so exciting to be able to work with these composers and hear like oh that's what you wanted that's great I can totally do that that's what that means and then maybe they you know revise their scores to reflect that so that it really conveys exactly what they want there's also all kinds of subtleties that are you're not able to put in the score that maybe a composer can share with you and and you know it's part of what makes every performance unique and different those little subtleties or those different interpretations um but when you get to explore that with the composer and sort of hear what they want and show what you're thinking and kind of have that collaborative relationship it's really special mm. it's almost like you have a, a... Well, it's not a co-composing role, but you're certainly a, a, an important creative consultant, you could say. Yeah, and I would say, like, I mean, sometimes it does almost feel like you're a co-composer. I know that um, my teacher, Judy Lomans, worked a lot with new music, uh, and she has said that there's been times where she's almost rewritten passages and sent them back to, like, very notable composers, and, and she's like, I kind of helped write this piece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't say that too publicly but like yeah inner yeah. inner knowledge inner knowledge inner knowledge that's cool and how do you find that this piece sits on the harp like is it quite is it written quite idiom idiomatically for for the harp or are there are there new things that that took you by surprise oh I felt like it fit really well in the hands it feels super comfortable to play I mean it's virtuosic and it's beautiful and it's exciting and it's energetic and it just feels great to play it's been so fun coming back and practicing it again it just feels like an old friend and it feels so nice to play something that sits well under the hands yeah i'm sure that cameron you've come across pieces where you're just like okay i get it but not not playable right Totally. Well, it's especially when you realize that most composers in history were all pianists and they wrote beautiful string music, but but often didn't really know how to how how the, what was comfortable in string playing. Um, and uh, I think it's in a way we're almost more I, and I'm, I think most of us now we get used to it. I always think like uh, Brahms chamber music in particular is, is, mm -hmm. is somehow always extremely awkward for the cello, which is so bizarre. It's great music. We would never not want to play it. So there's, I think there's always that, that balance between searching for something that's idiomatic and also letting the composer, um, you know, push, push the capabilities of the instrument a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this music, it's so emotive. It's, it's just so emotionally charged. You want to be able to express it with those slides and just, you know, the arrival to the note and, and preparing the note. And, uh, you know, it sounds like this piece allows for that quite nicely. Like when I listen to recording of of this, and I'm thinking, you know, from from a string player's perspective, then uh, it's it's just gorgeous. It's gorgeous writing. I guess it's mirroring the voice in many ways. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And and Kelly is such an expressive and, and free writer. I, I think that's what's been interesting for me anyways, making the comparison with the piece she wrote for me. I think that piece has no very few bar lines in it, if any. Uh, it really is this sort of like long cadenza, all about sort of sound colors and really all the timings are very approximate. And I can there's definitely passages in this piece as well where it feels very similar that there's this desire, there are buyer lines because we've got to get everyone synced up together, but there's a desire for them to be as invisible as possible. I love that in that third movement, it is really, it's a cadenza, right? It's not like, 
your, uh, your, your, your standard issue concerto that's tacked on to the end of the first movement where you get a cadenza moment. It's, uh, it's a dedicated third movement for cadenza for you too. Um, that's gonna be interesting to put together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no comment from either of you. <laughs> oh no, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be great. <laughs> it'll be wonderful. And, and what I love about that, Cadenza movement is the use of percussion in it as well. Just having that kind of woven into the texture is really cool. Yeah, very cool. All right, let's nerd out for a little bit. Uh, let, let's talk instruments. So Angela, what harp are you playing for this? Is this a new friend to you? Is this a lifetime partner harp? What is it? Uh, I, I'm going to be using my lifetime partner harp. I put, I have my little harp forest behind me right now. <laughs> um they're not they're not all mine they're mostly mine I'll be playing on this one here the brown harp behind me this is a lion and healy style 30 and this is my forever harp mm -hmm. or as forever it will last for I'm sure I've got at least another good 20 years with it um so this is this is my career harp I love it it is incredible and then I have um a couple smaller harps I use for teaching behind me and then this um, blonde harp here is actually the National Youth Orchestra of Canada's harp, and I'm just uh, taking care of it this year, maintaining it. So it's it's behind me, but I won't be performing on it. Lovely. And then the Lion and Healy, you've had that for how long? Ooh, I got that. Oh, now I have to do math. I got that around <laughs> when I started my doctorate. So <laughs> what year would that have been? Maybe 2010? They say musicians are good at math. We can roll with that. 2010, sure. I'm just going to say that definitively. Yeah, 2010. That's the year that I got that harp and it's probably right. Right. inaccurate, but. <laughs> that's okay. We're going to roll with that. So a harp has about a 30 year lifespan. Is that what you're saying? Before it kind of goes kaputs. Well, it, it, it can definitely vary. Um, what happens is because there's such an incredible amount of tension on a harp, the strings are really really creating that massive amount of tension on the instrument the soundboard starts to pull up over time the neck starts to twist things get a bit warped the wood you can replace several of those elements you can replace the soundboard you can replace the neck um but it'll just sort of be deciding at that point if if it's if I want to make that investment if I would like to move to a different instrument at that time that kind of thing but Love right it. now I'm really lucky my harp is in you know, no major, no major issues. So I feel very, very grateful. It's in its golden years. <laughs> it's in its golden years. Cameron, tell me what you're playing on. Yeah. So for a long time until just recently, actually, I had a wonderful cello on loan from the Canada Council Instrument Bank. Uh, I, I think last time I played with London Symphonia, I still had the Stradivarius on loan from them. Yes. Uh, yeah. And since then, uh, I, for the last four years, I was playing on this wonderful Spanish instrument uh, by a not very well-known luthier named Giammi from Barcelona, but it just had this beautiful, rich sound. Um, but I had to give that back. And so now I'm sort of in the this this ambiguous land of what, what does one do when one is used to playing on expensive old instruments? Because unfortunately for us, our, our sort of dream instruments are not so affordable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've sort of been, I've been in a way, uh, I guess I, I, I wouldn't say shopping around because I, I sort of came across this dream cello almost by chance. I, I became very interested in Spanish instruments from my experience with the last one and found a cello by the, the great Spanish luthier, Jose Contreras, uh, who uh, is, was the luthier to the King of Spain in the 1700s. Uh, and he was actually known as the Spanish Stradivarius because his cellos were, uh, well, his instruments in general, he, he had access to all these Stradivarius violins and cellos that came to the court of Spain. And he looked after all of them. So he was very good at replicating them. In fact, this instrument used to be known as a Stradivarius until recently when it was re, I was decided actually it was just probably by the Spanish luthier, um, which is nice for the price. You know, it makes it the price be a little bit less still way out of my price range so yes, yes. so now it's the whole challenge of, of you know finding maybe a patron that might want to want to buy an instrument like this but it's a fascinating it's a beautiful gorgeous instrument has a great sound yeah um, just repeat that last phrase it's about finding a patron who oh, might want to buy yeah, the yeah exactly it's about finding a patron that might want to have an alternative investment right <laughs> 
I don't know maybe if there's someone London there, based. Who knows? Maybe you there's someone London based. Things. Who knows? In any case, <laughs> I'm really hoping that I will have it. One of the things with these instruments is that it is being sold. And so I don't have a monopoly on being able to play it for as long as I want. Uh, so I'm hoping I will still have it for the Constant London, but I'm not sure yet. Um, uh, but One yes, road. it's a beautiful, beautiful instrument. So well, I'm crossing my fingers. Yeah, so, and it's the Canada Council that gets to introduce you to these amazing instruments, um, get you a taste for really expensive things. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure it's been an incredible, uh, an incredible experience to, to be able to play that Stradivarius and play the uh, Guillaume uh, instruments. And uh, do you have a bow? Oh, I've got two. The no, bow is much... bow, is it? That you're... Yeah, I have a bow. <laughs> it's much more of like, it, it's sort of much more of what we would call like a player's bow. I would, I just went, uh, I, I was trying a whole bunch of different things and, and just happened across a French 19th century workshop bow. No idea who made it, but it just happened to be a nice stick. And uh, for, for people who maybe like us, I feel like as string players, we know this, but it's not so much general knowledge that a big part of the quality of a bow in particular is the wood that's used. And it's this one specific wood, the Pernambuco wood from, from a tree in Brazil. Uh, and it's an endangered species now. So the bow makers today are these extremely talented craftsmen, but they, ha they don't have access to the wood that they had, uh, especially in France in the 19th century. And so sometimes it's just a matter of go try a whole bunch of bows from the 19th century and there'll be one that someone just lucked out with a good piece of wood and happened to make something nice out of it. So it's nice because it's very affordable for me, but it still plays nicely. Yay. Yeah, it, it is possible to find affordable string instruments. So. Yeah, too true, too true. Well, this is great. Um, thank you uh, to you both for joining me. I'm, I'm so looking forward to performing this piece with you in a matter of days. Have fun putting it together when you finally end up in the same city. And uh, yeah, thanks again. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Looking you. forward. Okay. Cheers.